kind, the global media technology innovators are proud to publish the MediaKind 2021 Sports D to C forecast. The biggest report ever compiled on the direct to consumer services offered by sports rights holders. Intelligence on 40 rights holders from across the Americas, Europe, and Asia. From the major leagues to niche properties, provide the industry's most comprehensive view to date of direct to consumer OTT trends, including fan engagement, monetization, use of archives, and the integration of data. The MediaKind 2021 Sports D2C forecast breaks down the key features of each of these 40 platforms and shares current benchmarks, future plans, and innovations fueling direct to consumer OTT services to sports fans around the globe. Download your personal copy from MediaKind.com. Hello today and welcome to today's MediaKind Explore series. Uh, today we're going to be covering our direct-to-consumer sports forecast for 2021. And we're so excited to be able to share this with you today. Uh, this, this session is part of a wider series that we have at MediaKind called MediaKind Explore. And if you go to MediaKind.com and you go under what's happening, at the top, you'll see a series of events and papers and blogs and all the things that we're currently uh, working on uh, on uh, great industry topics, including including this one. Uh, we'll actually be providing in the chat box a link to this paper um, where you can go and register and download uh, this particular forecast uh, today. So please check that out. And uh, I'm your host, Lisa Osaker, and I am VP of Media uh, Marketing and Communications here at MediaKind. And I would like to introduce our speaker today, D. Raj. D. Raj Vavola. Um, we'll be seeing his face here shortly. Hello and welcome. D. Raj is our uh, head of product uh, for our direct to consumer um, offerings. And he's going to actually be walking us through the paper that that we've done, um, which is a, a comprehensive, actually the most extensive study that's been done to date on sports properties that are are taking their offering direct to consumer. And over on the right side of the screen, you'll see uh, the the forty um, leagues or uh, sports rights um, owners that were studied and analyzed in the study. And um, over to the left, you'll see kind of the areas that we've covered. And that is what Diraj is going to be walking us through today. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Diraj. And uh, you can maybe introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and get us started. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm Diraj, uh, like Lisa introduced me, I head the product for the direct, direct to consumer uh, media solutions at uh, MediaKind. And i um, actually very excited to actually present the findings of the most extensive study that we've done, uh, speaking to uh, the sports entities, both in North America and Europe, and also present insights into what we see as trends in the space, uh, both in terms of what's been done in terms of experimentation over the last, uh, last five, six years, what's happening today and what the future trends are, and the thinking uh, that we've uh, noticed with respect to the the content owners, in this case, the leagues and the teams uh, in the sports space. Uh, in terms of things we wanna talk about, we talk, wanna talk a little bit about what is the current trends? What is it that, uh, where the revenues have been generated in the past? What are the, the headwinds the market is seeing in this space? Uh, as well as tailwinds and opportunities that uh, are being noticed as we look forward. So in general, I think the biggest observation, or probably this is pretty known fact, that most of the big leagues, the big sports entities, drive majority of the revenues currently to broadcast rights. So this is where we see a lot of headwinds because the broadcast rights today are anchored in pay TV subscriptions. And the pay TV subscriptions had peaked uh, early in 2000s, 
where we had about 90% uh, penetration of pay TV, uh, especially in the US market, but also globally, that was a trend. But if we notice what's happening in this space today, the pay TV market is starting to shrink to roughly about 67% uh, percent penetration, but is also shrinking at a rapid rate. So we see that that current trend will continue. So that puts a lot of pressure on what is the value of the content rights for sports entities as we head forward into an environment where PTV starts uh, providing diminishing value. And then uh, in terms of also deployed solutions for uh, direct to consumer uh, offerings out there, there's also a headwinds in terms of the technology changing very fast and and, and keeping up with that technology has been a, bit, a little bit of a challenge. Now, in terms of tailwinds and what OTT, over-the-top delivery, that enables sports contents to go direct to the consumer, uh, it, it actually opens up opportunities that didn't exist in the past or are, are things that you could not have done, possibly done in a broadcast delivery that are now possible in direct-to-consumer OTT deliveries. So there's two major themes here is in the past, uh, sports entities were not able to correctly monetize fans outside their major markets. Uh, with OTT and direct-to-consumer, that opens up a new opportunity where you could uh, and are actually being uh, addressed. Our fans that are not in the core markets where it was hard to uh, secure a reasonable or meaningful broadcast rights. But in addition to that, uh, OTT also provides you ways to engage your fan, the sports uh, entity's fans, in ways that was not possible in broadcast world. So in a broadcast world, most of the, the way the fan engaged with the sports content was what we would call a setback experience, an experience that was curated uh, mostly in the production phase by typically an expert who knows how to make that content exciting and entertaining. We still see value in that kind of content. Uh, also, decisions being made for the customer in terms of what's exciting from a camera angle perspective, from a data and statistics about the players, about the game, uh, historical information was all decided up front. And then most of the consumers or the fans had what we call a sit-back experience. With OTT and direct-to-consumer uh, direct technologies, the sports entities now have a way to connect directly to the fan, engage them, excite them in ways that was not possible in the past. Uh, give them control in terms of what would excite them from camera angles, audio feeds, commentary feeds, uh, data points, statistics, also clips from old, uh, old games that have relevance to the game that they're watching today. So there is new ways to engage the user. But as you are also engaging the user, there's new opportunities to personalize that experience, uh, bring an excitement that was not possible in that sit back experience. So as they go forward, the combination of that sit back and lean forward experience is what would make a fan's uh, engagement that much more exciting. Uh, and then when we also start looking at how does a sports league take that premium content that they own and increase the value of it, both in terms of securing good broadcast rights and also adding additional sources of revenue? So this is on top of the minds of most of the leagues that we've talked to both in Europe and in the US. The US market seems to be more of a leader in terms of experimentation that's already in place, as well as the thought process and the leadership that they bring to the to this field in terms of what's being planned as they move forward. Um, but there's a few more aspects that are also pretty interesting in terms of who is the technology provider in the broadcast uh, way of securing revenue rights versus what will happen in the future. In the old model where sports rights, the sports content rights owners like leagues and teams primarily depended on marketing and revenue generation uh, on the broadcasters. The broadcasters typically were the technology enablers. They were the ones who uh, invested in technology that took the experience, the delivery experience of the sports to the fans. 
Uh, as the new sports rights starts getting renewed, there's an opportunity for sports uh, rights and content owners, uh, like sports uh, leagues and teams, to be looking at uh, OTT uh, in terms of technology en enablement. So there's a competence that needs to be built as they address this market in new ways. So we are seeing a trend where sports leagues are starting to understand and are planning to build the competence in technology as well uh, in the sports and OTT delivery of content. So in terms of that, that's basically the primary things that we've seen as far as strategy goes is what are the headwinds in the market? What are the tailwinds? What are the new ways of engaging customers? And what are the new opportunities in terms of how do you monetize this premium content in ways that was not possible in the past? So dark markets, preserving revenues and increasing new ways of making revenue. So in today's markets, most of the revenues came from broadcast rights. There's a lot of significant revenue that came from in-venue tickets, merchandising, uh, ads and sponsorships. With D2C, we see that that potential for increasing the revenues uh, increases greatly. There's two areas where new sources of revenue seem to pop up in terms of uh, generating new new revenues. Uh, one of it is advertising, specifically, how do you target and personalize the ads? Uh, a new new area, another new area that uh, has been pretty uh, will have significant promise is the introduction of betting, especially in the U.S. sports, and how the sports data integration into the user experience enables on the spot betting. So as we go through this report, we talk a little bit more about what it takes to deliver these kind of experiences. And, uh, and also the focus of the leagues where they do realize that the content they produce, live is still the most important content that they put out there, which is what will drive the significant amount of revenues. And they're already delivering different ways in which the live content value can be increased. What we found surprising is a lot of the sports league that have experimented in this space so far have only done touch the surface of what's possible in the OTT delivery. In terms of putting out their content, delivering mostly subscription-based uh, offerings in the space. And all the rights holders uh, basically have some way to have a direct uh, to consumer live experience, which it complements their existing broadcast delivery. They're doing it either because they're building that te technology competence themselves or they're partnering with the rights holders like the major broadcasters. And in some places, we've also seen that they've partnered with technology providers to build the competence so they can deliver and have that relationship uh, with the fans themselves. So the second theme we've noticed is that the delivery platforms in direct-to-consumer space that have been deployed in the sports fields lack a lot of peak concurrencies and average concurrencies so far. It's mostly been a complement to the broadcast delivery of live content. So as the sports entities start look, uh, looking at using direct-to-consumer uh, mechanism, to do both, uh, engage the fan on the live content, but also how do you engage the fan before the game, during the game, after the game, but more importantly, how do you keep that fan engaged post-season, right? post-season, pre-season, and also during the season? So that's where we see that most of the content owners, the, the leagues and the teams are having plans and using their archive content as a way to keep the fans engaged postseason, as a way of engaging the, content, uh, the fan during live events in terms of analytics and statistics that can be garnered uh, using artificial intelligence and other technologies that are available today to make that in fans engagement even more critical. But the market is at an inflection point. We've seen that inflection point has already happened for entertainment content. When we talk about Netflix, we talk about Disney, they have already reached subscription amounts and, and transactional rates at a much higher pace. 
We believe the sports entities now are at that inflection point, and which is driven primarily by two things. The, the destruction of the pay TV model, as well as fans wanting to be able to do a direct to consumer experience, as well as the content rights that are coming up for renewal in the next four to five years. So as they do that, the, we expect the peak concurrencies as well as the average concurrencies for sports contents will be going through the roof pretty soon. So one of the key concerns that keeps coming up is that the platforms that, been, that have been delivered today do a pretty good job with being able to provide that experience in terms of live and being getting them access to the content. But when it comes to the future, as the peak concurrencies grow, scale becomes a significant concern for majority of the, of the leagues that we've interviewed. So most often when we think of scale, the first thing that comes to mind is the scale of the video platform, which is handled primarily through the CN. But often when we look at what media kind of specialized in this field, when we talk about sports and video content, is scale usually comes not just in delivering the bits and bytes for the audio and video, but it also comes in terms of how do you personalize that experience? How do you maintain that session? How do you, how do you personalize the ads? In addition to that, how do you also make sure that uh, pay-per-view or spot uh, transactions can also scale at levels that haven't been seen in direct-to-consumer space? Uh, this is normal in the broadcast world. I mean, talking about millions and millions of concurrent streams, uh, both on average as well as peak is normal in the broadcast world. And when we looked at MediaKind and our expertise in the video space, as well as delivering platforms that bring scale, uh, quality and robustness, these are the things that usually are the ones that most often are underlooked, right? Is, uh, sorry, are overlooked, is how do you scale the experience, not just the video? How do you scale the fact that now instead of having a single camera view, you're able to get multiple cam camera angle views uh, that engages the user in ways that wasn't possible in the past? How do you make sure that the sports data uh, that's now available at the fingertips of the fan is also scalable? How do you make sure that a million transactions coming in for a pay-per-view pay kind of event is, is done at, at scale? In addition to that, when we looked at the sports entities and their ambitions to grow, not just in their major markets, but also across the globe, we also have this separate element of scale that comes in in terms of building a platform that not just scales in the main market, but also is scalable in, in the, the reach markets across the globe. Uh, how do we do session management? How do you make sure that you're able to collect data points in terms of impression tracking, in terms of session management, in terms of how do you personalize that engagement for the user, both in terms of sports data and the camera angles and the video, and bring it in as an engaging experience that requires scale. So those are some of the big and major concerns that come up as teams when we speak to the leagues and, and team owners. In terms of the past experiences of getting majority of the revenues in, uh, with broadcast rights. And then the new models that are already deployed today is, is, is most of the leagues are right now planning on doing subscription-based models that basically gives you access to the in-season games as well as some amount of content from archives. And the things that we notice, it's a fairly wide net that's being cast uh, when it comes to subscription models. About 60% of the leagues we've talked to uh, either have a plan or are in the process of putting out a solution that enables for an annual pass. There's a, a huge preference to a subscription model where somebody is encouraged to buy an annual pass. But in terms of subscription revenues, they do enable uh, users to do monthly subscriptions and the more interesting ones where they can either purchase a game, a single game, or a uh, a bunch of games or games from a certain team. But there's also interesting models that also add additional scale requirements on the platforms in terms of spot buys. 
do you let the end user or the fan buy the last 10 minutes of the game, last quarter of the game, or portions of the game? So that brings an additional requirement in terms of how do you scale the system to be able to handle those loads, not just from delivering of the video and audio bits, bits and bytes, but also have a platform that delivers that scale when those peak occurrences do happen. In terms of pricing, uh, most of the content that we've talked, the content, the, most of the leagues that we've talked to uh, represent the premium leagues. And on average, uh, there's really not much of a surprise in terms of what the, the, the ticket prices are. Uh, premium services, roughly about yearly subscription averages are around $100. And then it gets a little more expensive when you sign up for um, a monthly or a specific Teams uh, package or parts portions of a game. Going next. So we talked about the new formats in which a sports entity is able to directly connect to the end user and able to engage them in ways that they haven't done. But a little bit of a surprise here is most of the sports uh, entities today don't employ the wide array of tools that are available to increase the fan engagement. So we have here a sample of things that have been deployed. So majority of the sports right, uh, sports owners have deployed the VOD as a way to engage the, the, the fans post-season and during the season. But as you look at more uh, other sources of revenues, uh, as such as personalized advertisement, they haven't been deployed widely. There's probably less than 8% of them that have either deployed or planning to deploy them right away. So these are some elements that came in a little bit as a surprise for us is, is the advertising is not a primary uh, delivery that has happened yet in the D2C space. Merchandise sales are right now mostly done on websites. They haven't really employed being able to personalize and sell merchandise to the fans directly on their platforms. Uh, to ticket walk tickets and selling of the, the subscription model is primarily the main motive that's been deployed by most of the leagues that we've talked to. So as we enter this space, uh, MediaKind has a long history and expertise in delivering video under uh, with a high degree of quality and robustness and scale. But we also has quite a bit of experience delivering these solutions in the broadcast and in the operator space where scale is a norm. Um, so I'm very excited uh, look, and looking forward to introducing new direct-to-consumer solutions for the sports field, where we primarily focus on helping the sports entities deliver an exciting and engaging experience for the fans, uh, as well as help them not only preserve their existing revenues, but also uh, help them find new sources of revenues that, that does need a lot of technology uh, enablement that needs to happen. One of the examples of an area where we have deep expertise is in advertising. We've been deploying uh, personalized ad solutions in the operator and the uh, broadcast worlds for over 10 years. And when we talk about advertising solutions, primarily people think of pre-rolls, post-rolls, but there's a wide array of tools that are impliable in this space in terms of not addressing just the pre-rolls, the mid-rolls, post-rolls, but also being able to address advertising both at a national level uh, and then being able to target it all the way to the per personal level. In addition to it, there's different flavors of advertising that usually come in, the in-video, uh, advertising, the in-app advertising, the sponsorship enablement that can happen, uh, advertising that can happen in the venue space, but also media kind has invested a lot of R&D work in terms of new ways of engaging the user. Uh, think of 360 video, think of uh, VR experiences where you could also be uh, using that space very creatively to insert uh, personalized ads without actually getting in the way of the user's experience. Lisa, do we have any major questions so far? 
So I've just typed in the chat box that this is this is the place to direct your questions if you have any. Um, please don't hesitate to type them in. We'll take as many as that we as we can during this uh, the time that we have today. Um, one question that we have uh, so far, and um, we've actually gotten this question a few times from uh, some of the analysts that, that we spoke to um, when introducing this report. And the question was, um, you know, what surprised us most um, from from the findings? And um, I'll uh, I'll turn it over to 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 Deeraj to uh, talk about his uh, his biggest surprises. But mine was certainly kind of what's shown in the the last those last slide that we were just looking at, which is that we're, you know, literally just seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, the things that the extra things that can be done in the experience of, of fan engagement and direct to consumer in sports. So um, <clears throat> things like, you know, advertising just being, you know, re really only being used about 8% um, of the, the, those that were surveyed in the, the study, um, and really, you know, only one uh, using uh, any sort of ticketing options and and, you know, merchandising. But I mean, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's there's so much um, more that can be done within these experiences that really engage fans. So how about you, D. Raj? What was your biggest surprise? Actually, the advertising was the biggest surprise because we've been engaged in advertising in other spaces for so long. I pretty much assume that this would have been more prevalent in this market space, especially in the direct to consumer space where you could not just target, but almost personalize the ad. Mm -hmm. The second area that I found a little bit of surprise was the concern around scaling, right? So especially when we leagues that have already experimented in the space for D2C, uh, they've found that uh, when they had built solutions in the past that relied on vendors that primarily basically were system integrators. Basically, they found a bunch of uh, vendors that they need to fulfill the end-to-end -end need of a D2C solution, all the way from capturing the, the content in the venue, processing it, making sure it's stored in the most appropriate formats and ready to deliver in the, for multiple, all device kinds out there is they found that it was challenging on two fronts. One is the technology is changing at a rapid pace. Uh, so when they relied on vendors that basically cobbled together solutions using multiple vendors on uh, technology, it was hard to innovate at a fast pace and keep up with market trends. And they also hit quite a few uh, scaling issues and uh, gaps in in being able to address this market properly because it's hard to control the life cycle of multiple vendors. Uh, that actually gave us a little bit of insight in how MediaKind should be approaching this market in terms of leveraging our end-to-end -end portfolio. Right, we have the widest portfolio in the market when it comes to video technologies. Uh, and how do you partner with a few other entities that you need to to create that engaging user? experience while maintaining that underlying quality of the video which is which is the most important thing for sports uh, as well as being able to build it in a way that's robust scalable and deployable globally and then as the second thing that also came up as a surprise is is how betting seems to be in the in the minds of almost every one of the uh, the leagues where it's starting to become legal especially in the us so the potential revenues uh, associated to it also puts a lot of emphasis on low latency delivery of the video itself, right? Because that enables not betting on spot events. Uh, so those two things seem to be the big themes is uh, lack of deployment of ads as a revenue generator. And then the concern that the leaks that either deployed and experimented in this phase uh, their concerns on being able to produce future direct-to-consumer solutions that can bring that robust, scalable models uh, is the key. Well, well, thanks for that. And and there's been some uh, additional great questions coming in. Um, this is a good one. Don't consumers want OTT because it's largely ad-free? Can you make ads palatable and or dynamic? That's a that's an excellent question. It's actually on the top of our minds, and it's been uh, on top of 
our minds at media time for a while is when we look at broadcast the the significant revenues that broadcasters are able to pay is driven by ads each sport is different in how the ads get inserted into it the significant research that's already done that each sport there's a different way to monetize the ads but as we look into the d2c options there's multiple strategies that the content owners are deploying is especially when they're going after a market that's not their major market meaning where they have significant revenues from broadcast rights uh, they would deploy the solution free but supported by ads it's a way to get the fan what he needs an engaging experience that gives him uh, control and uh, excitement at the end, at the tip of his fingers but at the same time there is a there's a way to introduce ads in a way that's non obstructive right i mean that's that's kind of what we were referring to is when we deploy this in scale the ad a personalized ad is more desirable than a personalized ad but putting that ad not just in the video itself but being creative in terms of using the app as a way to put the ad uh, putting it inside the video in a in a non obstruct obstructive way as well as creatively using the space uh both inside the venue uh where you could use uh, specialized ad technologies to put ads into the banners itself personalize ads into the banner itself as well as using vr expected experiences as a way to enhance the user's experience as well as putting ads in spaces that were not possible in the past for example we did a uh, we did a project in europe where we did a 360 companion experience so it's not your primary sit back experience it's a companion that gives you a lean forward experience where you could pick a camera angle but also be able to kind of move around in that space a 360 space to be able to experience that sport in a way that you were not in, in the past but at the same time as you're doing it we could creatively add right in the back of the basketball uh, uh, right behind the basket or uh, where you're seeing the audience so there's creative ways of doing it where you can increase the revenue coming in from ads without it getting in between the fan and his experience. Well, that's cool. And there's a, a yet one more ad related question. Um, with targeted advertising as one of the ways forward, how is MediaKind envisioning it amongst um, all the data governances, CCPA, GDPR, et cetera? So when it comes to privacy and governance, we adhere primarily to the countries we operate in. Uh, the rules change for each country. Uh, most often we do partner with a local uh, expert in terms of what data can be used for targeted advertising versus what cannot be used. And we are fairly compliant with respect to uh, following those rules. Absolutely. Okay. It just um, changes the way how well you can personalize, right? You can target instead of personalizing. And it depends on the local rules. It depends on this, the, the content owner's preference. In this case, the league and, and team could make a decision that says, this is how far we go. Uh, we are primarily more concerned about enabling technologies that let the teams in sports make those choices. Um, and make those choices and deliver it at scale. Great. Um, and so kind of a general question here. Um, this question is with this kind of solution, um, you know, what's needed? A new platform, new technology? Um, you know, maybe you can have some comments about like kind of what's needed for the future uh, of uh, direct to consumer sports. So when we talk about D2C, there's actually a, a layered cake. There's a lot of grunt work that goes behind making that fans engagement exciting. Uh, the, but what's common in all the sports is the importance of video and the importance of capturing the pristine quality video uh, at frame rates that make sense for that uh, for that for that for the game. And then also being able to deliver it at a cost that enables uh, the, the monetization of that content. So from capture of the content in the venue 
transporting it into uh, into the cloud, being able to process it and create the right layers of the video and audio, uh, both not just for the curated primary feed, but also the additional cameras that are being planned as part of that user experience. Being able to link all those cameras together, the metadata that goes with it together. And then the importance of sports data that ties to both the live content as well as to the archive content. Being able to mine the archive content to enhance the experience both of the out of season VOD archive content, as well as more importantly, the experience of the live game. That's becomes a significant, uh, uh, significant R&D investment and effort that needs to be put in. And then in terms of the layer that goes on top of it, which is the app and the experience where you personalize it based on the sport, uh, each sport is different. They're not all the same, even though the video portion and the audio and the, the commentary portion is the same. Uh, but where it changes and differs is <clears throat> how those user experiences are created for the different sports and what kind of opportunities it gives in terms of putting ads or not putting ads, uh, in terms of how do you integrate sports data into that experience. So what's needed is that the, the, the video and audio space where you can build the competence, uh, have the solutions that can deliver the, 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 the scale and the quality, and then be able to let the league own the, the brand, right? Their brand is typically the app that's consumer facing. So build a solution that helps them go to the market quickly, but also be able to help them customize that UX specific to their game, specific to their brand. Um, so th that's that's really where most of the effort is going to go into. and. From a media kind perspective, it's fairly simple for us. We already know how to build the video and the audio pipe, robustly being able to handle the new use in, in terms of complex additional feeds that come in, how do you type together, how do you put the data points together, but also help the customer, in this case, the team and the league that wants to maintain their own brand and the, the link to the customer, give them tools, basically SDKs and APIs that help you hook into that underlying platform and quickly customize and maintain your own brand. So that, that's where we see is the future, right? That's, that's the need for technology in terms of leveraging OTT to personalize that experience and engage the fans, but also build platforms that are scalable, are cloud uh, deployable and quick to innovate on. Because this, this field has been experimental in the last five months. It's starting to get to an inflection point where T2C will become, at some point in the future, the primary delivery of sports content uh, using OTT technologies. Um, and then also the need for doing low latency delivery of the video content itself. So those are areas where new systems and solutions that leverage OTT technology will be, will be needed for our sports entities. Thanks, thanks so much. And then there's an, there, here's a fun question. Um, how do you see the use of VR in the space? And I know that you had commented on um, that second screen 360 um, experience that we did um, a while back. Uh, but any color to add to that or, or other scenarios that you see playing out? So MediaKind has been experimenting and delivering POCs and R&D work in the space for a little while, actually. I was actually very excited when we started this work almost three, four years ago. A couple of findings that are probably outside of this report, but it's a theme that we've seen when we were part of Ericsson and uh, doing a lot of research with respect to VR and how 5G can be leveraged for VR and how it applies to the sports uh, ecosystem. The biggest theme that came up is users might not want to use VR as their primary experience. Sports is a social experience. It brings people together. People typically want to see sports uh, on a 10 foot experience, big TVs, uh, home theaters, and then they usually share it with their family or friends. A VR as a medium of, of, of enjoying sports is not that great because then it isolates you in ways you're not ready for yet. 
Um, VR is important to enhance the experience both in the stadium. Unfortunately, we don't see much of it today, but that's not going to last for too long. The stadium experience is going to come back. So in terms of enhancing the value of the box, the VR is a very good tool, because another way to experience the game. Uh, but when you take that same VR and take it home, you're usually constrained by a couple of things. You're constrained by network congestion. Uh, VR in its true sense will take 100 plus to 150 megabits per second. But how do you build technologies that help you deliver VR all the way into the home? Not necessarily as a, a headset experience, but more as a companion experience is what we saw resonates in the market. So MediaKind has deployed technologies that takes essentially what's 150 plus megabits per second experience deliverable at home in 4G speeds, right? Basically under 20 megabits per second. So we see value where it's a companion experience. It can be supported on a VR headset, but most users I don't believe will use, watch the entire game in VR. They'll probably watch parts of it or interesting parts of it. Uh, shifting camera angles, in addition to watching that, what we call the lean back experience on the big, big TV. And then on your device, being able to kind of move around and see a 360 experience as well, uh, especially triggered by events. Like when there's a goal, you, you, you probably go, I love the, the angle that somebody picked for me in the face, but now can I see that same game from a different camera, hopefully in 360, that way I can see a lot more details. Hopefully that answered the question. This is a, a good answer, thank you. Um, and um, the I think uh, the trial, the public trial, one of them that um, is available to look at is something that we did with Deutsche Telekom two years ago. And um, we have, there's a lot in the press about that particular um, uh, live, a broadcast of a basketball game in 360, uh, 6K experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, we won uh, a number of industry awards on that one. So there's a, a lot to read uh, about that experience and what we learned from it. And then we also have a paper that came out um, uh, January of this year, which was on 5G um, live video contribution. And we talk a lot about things like uh, immersive um, second screen experiences that, that coincide with, with live, live broadcasts, especially for live sports. So um, that's another one to check out. If you go to what's, what's happening um, at the top of our uh, mediakind.com uh, webpage, you'll be able to see um, the news and uh, uh, about what we did with Deutsche Telekom. Um, for 360, and you'll also be able to read that that white paper on on 5G live video contribution. And speaking of 5G, we have another question that's rolled in, and this question is, how does 5G change the landscape? Yeah, I've spent a significant amount of time in 5G as part of Ericsson, which we've actually helped create a lot of use cases that leverage 5G. So we have significant insights in terms of being part of that Ericsson family. Uh, here's what we've noticed is with sports organizations engaging the fan and finding new ways of engaging the fan is critical, right? It's critical to keep that fan engaged, but also uh, keep them coming back for more. So what is possible in venue is now uh, increased because of 5G. So in the past, for you to have a camera capture from the field, it was usually uh, tied to a network cable. But when we talk about how do you engage the fan in terms of what he can see on the field, both from a video and audio perspective, right? being able to hear the players, being able to see a certain angle from a, with cameras that are deployed on the player or an audio device that's deployed on the camera, or general metrics of heartbeat and things like that, right? I mean, it does not apply to all games, but a lot of games, 5G enables use cases that were not possible without it. Right? Having that uplink bandwidth that can support a lot of data feeds coming from the stadium, uh, being able to deploy 
maybe a private 5G uh, for that stadium and enabling those use cases, I believe is going to be the most exciting part, right? Is in terms of creation of that experience, in terms of capturing the feed from the stadium. So that's one exciting area where 5G helps. And broadly, 5G does help on the delivery side too, right? It, it, it just offers a much bigger pipe to a lot more people. Um, and, and, and generally will enhance the experience of, of the video, uh, especially the video and audio elements of the game. Uh, as OTT becomes more of a, a common delivery mechanism for sport. Absolutely. And yeah, and please, please check out that that paper that we did um, in January that you'll find on our, our website under papers. Um, it explores kind of the whole the whole new freedom associated with live video contribution um, in in an era of 5G. Um, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff in that one. So at this time, any this is kind of last call for questions, because uh, at the moment, I don't have any fresh ones coming in. Um, but I will uh, I will explain uh, a little bit about our Media Kind Explore program and see if if there's anybody who has a, a final thought they want to slip in there. So um, I think uh, in the chat box, um, our team will will place a link. Um, Basically, we wanted to uh, make sure that everybody has awareness that this this um, session that you saw today is part of a wider series offered by MediaKind that explores different industry topics. Um, sometimes it's about um, uh, you know studies like this one, or application, or white papers that that we've written, um, and sometimes uh, it's uh, exploring a topic. Uh, a panel with um, our partners or customers. Um, and so uh, it's just meaningful for us uh, to be very active with our uh, industry community, get feedback from, from you all, get your questions, and have this, this time with you. So uh, please, at any time you uh, want to, to know a little bit more about what's offering, what's coming up, or what you can view on demand, please just go to what's happening on mediakind.com. And uh, we welcome you to check out everything that's there. We also have a, a, a portion called Tech Talks, which is the on-demand version of, of these sessions that have been abbreviated. So if you only have like 10 minutes, um, you can slip one of those in pretty quickly too. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining today. And a big thank you to you, Dheeraj, for walking us through all of these findings. It is a, a pretty substantial um, paper. And we encourage everyone to download it and, and use it. Thank you, everyone, for giving us an opportunity to explain through our plans as well as our findings in this space. All right. Well, what a fantastic close to 2020 and um, wishing everybody a happy new year. And uh, talk to you guys all soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.